Hey, Dan. Hey, yeah. Hey, hey, again. How are you? Uh, are you feeling any better? I know we were sick about the same time and, and uh, we had to skip the podcast last week. And, you know, honestly, I'm not really feeling that great today. Yeah. You know, I feel better, but I'm not a hundred percent. I had my first ever experience with pneumonia and it was pretty horrible. Yeah. I, I had my first bout with uh, COVID uh, a couple months ago. Now this is the second one. I mean, I'm just still feeling pretty terrible. You know, once I got sick, nothing seemed to make me feel better. I tried every conceivable form of cold medication and got no relief. In fact, the only thing that seemed to work for me was prolonged moaning. Moaning? Yeah. I kind of, I lie in my back. I pull the blankets up to my chin and then I just kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> come, come on, man. Like, how does that make you feel better? I don't know. It just does. Like somehow the moaning seems to distract me, you know, from the achiness and congestion, you know, just long enough that I eventually fall asleep. You should try it. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. No, no, not like that. Like this, get really deep down into your moaning center. Uh, 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 no, 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 more like this. Uh, 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 uh. So, did, did you feel any better? Uh, no, but I, I did forget that I'm sick for a moment, so there's that. Excellent. The Winnipeg Free Press proudly presents, in partnership with CJNU 93.7 FM, Nigan and the Lone Ranger. Here are your hosts, Nigan Sinclair and Dan the Lone Ranger Let. Welcome to another uh, episode of Nigan and the Lone Ranger. Uh, we were, as the intro indicated, not available for podcasting last week uh, because of various forms of illness. And, uh, you know, I, I'm actually a little surprised, and again, like uh, that I, how bad I felt about not being able to do the podcast last week. I mean, I felt just generally bad, but I, I actually kind of miss not doing it. I got... Like I realized that people actually listen to this thing, and oh, good uh, Lord. You know, I had messages, people going, "Hey, when's the next one dropping?" And I'm like, "We're both writhing in agony right now." So uh, <laughs> there's no there's no podcast this week, and so I was on the Mama Bear Clan walk, and one of my uh, friends who I walk with every Sunday for a bunch of years <laughs> said, "I feel this in tremendous gap in my life that you didn't have a podcast," and I was like, "Wow." Okay, well, I guess so. We get, we have a few people listening. So, hi, Denise. <laughs> listener, li- the the uh, the ground zero listener, Denise. Welcome aboard. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, like the I, I leaving a gap in people's lives. I'm not sure I got involved in podcasting to fill gaps. Uh, like that seems like a lot of responsibility, but whatever. Um, speaking of responsibilities. Um, you and I are both sort of fascinated about the recently concluded uh, public hearings, the Commission of Inquiry into the federal government's decision. Sort of. To conclu- declare- sort of. Conclu- <laughs> sort of concluding. Like, that's like I right. think it's well, probably going to, I mean, they had presentations all this week um, right. from academics and professionals. Uh, now, of course, we wait almost uh, eight to nine months for a report to come out. Uh, but it's been full drama. I mean, anyone who likes soap operas, this has been the one to watch. Well, and I'm I'm not sure as well that people appreciate the fact that governments, A, rarely call commissions of inquiry into their own decisions because it, it's kind of a losing proposition uh, from a political perspective normally. And, and secondly, first ministers almost never testify at these things. Oh, and imagine uh, this you know, happening in the United yeah. States. Like imagine that happening. Like the whole fight in the uh, in over this uh, January sixth uh, thing in the United States is that you know Trump won't won't testify, uh, refuses to. Uh, family members refuse to. Uh, all the people that were involved in the back, uh, including you know Supreme Court justices, won't won't appear. So the whole idea that you know we had an open nationally televised moment in which the prime minister uh, came to talk about how he made a decision. Of course, this is a legally mandated 
uh, commission. I mean, it, it has to take place because of the act says that uh, right. because because when you evoke the Emergencies Act, you have to draw a commission afterwards to justify or to investigate. Did the government meet the bar of uh, employing such an act that frankly, you know, is a pretty heavy hand, but in this situation perhaps was needed. And the argument of the government is that it wasn't really an emergency or it was an emergency. I mean, they can't define whether it was an emergency Mm -hmm. or not. Uh, According to the act, it's talking about, uh, did it meet the criteria of an emergency? According to CSIS, they say it didn't meet their bar, but the government said that because of the failure of public services, particularly the police, that it therefore... Uh, met the criteria of an emergency right. to invoke the act. Yeah, and the and the the head of CSIS did say though at one point, like he started by saying, "No, uh, the Emergencies Act is not uh, appropriate," and then later came back and said, "You know, as events have evolved, we think it could be applicable." I mean, it's the first ever use of this legislation, so I think it's it is a it's a it's a good opportunity to uh you know to review the decision and make sure that legally constitutionally you know it was sort of justified the political theater of it though uh, is is really quite fascinating because it was quite clear early on Justin Trudeau really wanted to appear at, at the inquiry you know while Ontario premier Doug Ford was uh <laughs> basically employing a uh, a battery of uh of his own lawyers to prevent the uh, the commission from calling him, you know, falling back on cabinet confidentiality and uh, legis- uh, parliamentary yeah, privilege. Doing everything possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Trudeau really, really wanted this, and I haven't seen, a, a, you know, maybe somebody smarter than me has already drawn a parallel, another columnist. But didn't you kind of think this was a this was the younger Trudeau, the Trudeau two a uh, moment to to say like just watching oh, you know like uh, undoubtedly i mean his and and his performance during the uh during his testifying was was quite good i mean i think uh, he looked prime ministerial he was very clear he even used the word serene you know <laughs> like like his whole approach uh but you know it, it the entire inquiry if you want to see a sort of dramatic story I mean, you had the bad guys, which was the convoy organizers who got a big footprint in this for a national platform. Yeah. Uh, the most hilarious moment in the entire uh, arrival of the convoy organizers was Pat King, organizer Pat King, complaining that he has no free speech, but yet freely sharing his views on national television. Uh, so it's this weird sort of absurd moment. And then you have the the sad victims which was at the beginning of the inquiry the the people who live in downtown ottawa and then what you had at the end is the government who got the final word uh to be able to explain well you know we had to do something because the 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 police were overwhelmed you had a full arc of a story all the way finally ending with justin trudeau uh saying things that you know here's why i had to do it and, and really talking about himself and kind of a a championing of a championing of the little guy kind of thing. Yeah, and just you know, for uh, for the benefit of uh, our younger listeners, so uh, you know, when uh, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau invoked the War Measures Act to deal with the FLQ crisis in Quebec, you know, uh, he was asked, you know, if he thought that the government was was overreacting and. And, you know, how could the government suspend civil liberties? And and uh, the elder Trudeau's response was, well, you know, just watch me. And so there was there was an element of that to, to Justin Trudeau's testimony, his uh, his claim that he was serene with the decision. Um, he made it quite clear that, at least outwardly, he's not really concerned about whether the uh, the Commission of Inquiry determines that the the use of this uh, heavy-handed legislation was legally justifiable. Um, you know, certainly the government did provide a lot of background indicating that they they had a lot of intelligence on potential armed threats, violence, uh, you know. Uh, they started uh, talking racial... about Alberta. They started talking yeah, about that's right. Alberta and Windsor. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, like the out of all of this, if you were to say a just watch me moment, 
Um, it really is uh, a co- sort of a shot across the bow against the Conservative Party, because what you have here is deafening silence from Conservative leaders, particularly Polyev, Pierre Polyev, who just have not been present, not spoke out, not made many statements whatsoever about the Emergencies Act uh, or the Commission, um, <coughs> generally have not affiliated themselves with the convoy organizers taking selfies yeah. like they did during the occupation. And so you've got really the Liberals here setting themselves up uh, in relation to the Conservatives of saying, you know, we're the ones speaking for the people here. And the deafening silence on the side of the Conservative, uh, on, the, on the House side, mm-hmm. has been just uh, absolutely, uh, at times, unbelievable. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the what we're really, we, we are seeing uh, partly the narrative and strategy that the Liberals are going to use going into the next election. And, I, you know, like, because it, it's, I think that, you know, uh, beyond the absurdity of some of the things that, that Polyev says uh, about harm reduction strategies and drugs and crime and all this other stuff, like he, he's so very clearly trying to tap into this mythical silent majority of Canadians that, you know, have libertarian tendencies. I, I don't believe that that there's been any indication that any candidate that fully basted themselves in the rhetoric of that constituency, uh, that there are enough people there to get you elected to anything. That, that having been said, and this is, I also want to make it clear for the people who are going to email me and probably email you and say, oh, you know, you just, you love the liberal government, you love Justin Trudeau. I mean, this is this is a, a deeply fall, you know, flawed first minister leading a deeply flawed government. I mean, they are, in all respects, a hot mess What's interesting, though, and I don't know how you feel about it, I think that the the this commission of inquiry in the Emergencies Act and the and the the really the botching of the response by the conservatives, they are playing right into Trudeau's hands. Well, the the problem really is is that the conservatives um, tried the middle route with Aaron O'Toole, and now there is enough conservatives in the major power brokers of the party to say, well, we tried that route, we tried the middle path, and now what we want to go is just full-blown hard to the right and appeal to those kind of anti-Trudeau factions and try to ally them together. Because there is a significant amount of anti-Trudeau feeling, I mean, we know that in the West here, but then particularly in segments of Ontario and Mm -hmm. Quebec, there 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 is votes to be gained there. The problem is, is that there is a glass ceiling with that amount, mm-hmm. and they're, they'll they'll definitely perhaps increase their amount of seats that they have currently, but still will probably never be able to form government with just the anti-Trudeau sentiment itself, unless they provide some kind of alternative. And mm-hmm. just chanting just inflation, putting out really offensive uh, videos on drug reduction, uh, putting out pretty absurd metaphors talking about buying a loaf of bread. Those things will only get you so far. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. You know, it's been interesting watching um, the national media lineup on, uh, on uh, the, the commission of inquiry and Trudeau's testimony. And again, like, which, which is a really great foreshadowing to some of the, the positions uh, that we're going to see the media take during the election. So, um, you know, not surprisingly, but the Sun Media newspapers and the National Post are, you know, clearly and utterly offended by the by the application of the Emergencies Act. And they are like to tell you the truth, the conservatives wouldn't wouldn't be badly placed to look at, um, you know, some of the columnists from the National Post and what they're saying, uh, because, you know, they're critical of the decision almost uh, universally critical of the decision. Uh, and they've concluded that it was improperly applied even before the Commission of Inquiry finishes their work. But, you know, they, they certainly don't go as far as to embrace uh, the spirit and, uh, and the, the substance such as it is of the, of the Freedom Convoy. Um, the Globe and Mail, on the other hand, uh, Robin Urbach wrote a column this past week, uh, which I think was, you know, I mean, I guess maybe it's predictable from the Globe and Mail, but the, the headline was 
Like, who was the prime minister who testifies in the Emergencies Act inquiry, and how do we get more of him? So, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think that there are, I mean, you know, um, media personalities, news organizations, we're people with our own, you know, we have institutional and individual biases and worldviews. I think that for the, the media in Ottawa, in the center of the, of the political universe, there is a sense that they're kind of looking. They're, they're looking for a reason, like they've been criticizing uh, Polyev and the, and, the, uh, and the Conservatives soundly, but they also want a reason to kind of get behind the alternative. And I, I think that, that that's also setting up an interesting sort of uh, preview of, uh, of the, the flow of public opinion. Well, especially since the, I mean, <clears throat> the Trudeau government always seems to be moving from crisis to crisis, but, but when they perform admirably and well, I mean, they, they, it's notable. And uh, I think that this, uh, the appearance of the prime minister, and then also, you know, Christopher Freeland and, and others within the government, uh, I mean, the only one that really looks terrible out of this besides the convoy organizers are the police and particularly mm-hmm. RCMP commissioner, Brenda Lucky, which I think everybody realizes that that need, there needs to be change at the top of the RCMP. Um, but we'll see. And of course, this report will take probably forever to come out. So uh, we'll still be talking about this next year sometime and and uh, as we go. But let's uh, let's get to our storyteller segment for today. Yeah. Uh, we have a wonderful, just amazing poet, uh, Chandra Mayer, who's uh, going to give us a story on uh on what it was what's it like to be a poet that that's right and uh we're actually uh we're doing mayor times two today because <laughs> uh following uh chandra's uh, amazing story we have uh an exclusive sit down uh, an extended interview with uh newly minted mayor scott gillingham hi i'm chandra mayor and i'm a poet artist and grandmother and this is The Storytellers. I've been asked to tell a story about my best experience as a poet. And so it was hard to narrow down, but here goes. Um, in about 2005, I was asked to be part of this crazy project called The Poetry Train. And the idea was that it would be like the festival train that rolled across Canada in 1970 with um, The Grateful Dead and Janis Joplin and the band and and uh, uh, and that whole scene, except it would be poets from all across Canada and people would get on the train for readings and workshops and it would be this whole sort of poet poetry extravaganza. Um, super great idea that fell apart in a couple of places. There were some miscommunications. Um, and when we got on the train, six of us, six poets from all across Canada got on the train in Winnipeg to go west across the prairies to Jasper um nobody knew the people on the train didn't knew didn't know about it there the advertising hadn't quite happened um and so mostly the train was full of families from ontario on spring break trying to get to bc just to have a nice time oh and some angry curlers there was a big uh, curling thing in alberta maybe and the curlers lost and they didn't want to hear our poetry it was it was you know we were troopers everyone was you know Everybody were very p- polite Canadians about it, but it was uh, a bit discouraging running back and forth on the train, reading our poetry to people who mostly just looked at us with sort of uh, glassy eyes and, and fixed, polite smiles. Um, once we got to Jasper, we got off the train and drove around northern BC in uh, big white vans for a few days before we finally ended up in Prince George for the Writers' Festival there. Somewhere along the way, somewhere in northern BC, I don't even remember which town it was because it just at some point it felt like a blur. We stopped in a town to do some readings. We all piled out of the van and (laughs) we were sent to a little grocery store. That was, the town had decided, the best venue to host the poets, this little grocery store. So we go to the grocery store and we walk in, and my gosh, the whole town had come out. It was the most amazing thing. There were all of these people, old people, little kids, all packed in amongst the, you know, tins of tomato soup and the, the cat food in the aisles. And they were all wrapped, right? Like they were, it was like the circus had come to town, which I guess it kind of had because we were a bit of a motley crew, including, you know, iconic Canadian, uh, Canadian poet Bill Bissett with his wild hair and his Moroccan and uh, another Canadian poet who at the time was writing poems about 
uh, the scientific names and properties of mushrooms. It was a very, it was a very motley crew. Um, I was reading a lot of very depressing poetry about some, you know, really dark times in my life. But these people all stood there and listened, right? They just drank it in. And for the first time in this whole sort of gong show of a trip, we felt really connected with the, with the people that we were reading to, right? Like the whole thing finally came together and the festival train part hadn't quite worked and the, the angry curlers and the whatever, whatever, whatever. But once we actually got to a place where we could stand and look at the people and the people were there because they really wanted to hear what we had to say, no matter how bonkers or insane or weird or strange, like I realized and I felt it at that moment, like this is what it's about, right? This is what it's about, trying to articulate our truths to people who are actively wanting to hear and apprehend our truths standing amidst the tomato soup tins. So that was the highlight of that trip. That was a really beautiful day as a poet. And that was one of my best experiences. In October of this year, uh, Winnipeggers went once again to the polls to elect a new mayor. It was sort of uh, a historic election for a number of reasons. There was no incumbent running. Mayor Brian Bowman had stepped down. Anytime there's no incumbent running in a mayoral election, uh, you can expect a lot of candidates and uh, a lot of twists and turns in the campaign. And I think that this campaign sort of lived up to this billing. Uh, the eventual winner was Scott Gillingham who had served for eight years on city council. Uh, prior to coming into uh, municipal politics, for 22 years he was a pastor uh, in the Pentecostal church. And uh, he is now, uh, for better or for worse, he is now the man uh, with his finger on the pulse of the city and uh, leading us bravely into, the, uh, into a new age. And uh, Mayor Scott Gillingham is with us this morning. Good morning. It's great to be with you both. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks very much for being here. First of all, how do you feel about being called your worship? Are you are you digging that yet? Or that, that's a little heavy. That that, <laughs> that title is just a little heavy. I I prefer uh, prefer mayor, but I, I know historically that's um, that's the title that goes with with the post. I'm I really am just here to do my best to serve the people of Winnipeg, working with others to build a, a better city. Um, and well, for the purposes of this uh, podcast, because of course we're all good friends once you're on the podcast. So I, I'm going to call you Scott, if that's okay. That would be excellent. I appreciate okay. that. Thank you. So the, the the mayor election that was, uh, tell me what it was like for you. Uh, it it was um, exhilarating and unusual, and the outcome. I wouldn't say it's improbable, but it, it certainly was. There was uh, a little bit of intrigue on election night. So what? Tell me what uh, what it was like for you. Well, it, it was just like you say. It, it was exhilarating. Um, it was, you know, looking back, you know, frankly, it was exhausting. By the time it was all said and done, the mayoral campaigns are so long. Um, you know, six six month campaigns are longer than provincial campaigns or federal campaigns. And so, by the time it was done, we had given it all we had. Myself, my my wife, our, our family, our team. So. Um, it was it was that mix of exhilaration and a bit a bit, a bit, a bit exhausting, but you you know for, from the start I really believed that we had a chance to to win the election and be successful. Uh, early on, we'd even contemplated the entrance of uh, of Glenn Murray and what that might do to you know just our overall chances in the campaign and. We were clear, uh, you know, as a team internally, we talked about even in May June that. Um, by the time it came to the final week of the campaign, we wanted it to be a two-person race. And if, if Glenn Murray was in the race, we wanted it to be myself and Glenn Murray. For that to happen, a few things had to happen. We had to have a really clear strategy and platform, which I believe we did. We had to be honest with voters. We were about the tax increases and frontiers that we increased. Uh, and we had, to, we had to get a few breaks along the way. And when you know the news came out of Alberta um, regarding Glenn, um, that was... That partly, you know, we saw things begin to shift at that time. And so all that had to come together and, and it did. 
So the it's interesting. Um, so election night, uh, we we've come to expect that a mayoral election without an incumbent draws a lot of candidates and it draws a higher voter turnout. That's traditionally been the case. Right. It wasn't the case this time. So a couple things. Uh, were you surprised about the low voter turnout and and why do you think that happened? And how much of a loop did it send you? Uh, when a one particular television station declared your opponent the victor <laughs> late in the evening, did that? Uh, did was there a moment of like, you know, well, I, you know, I'll, I'll use the acronym, uh, a WTF moment, or were you pretty sure that they were off base? Uh, I'll answer the second uh, question first. You know, our our team had come into. We, we were, our, our whole family was in a, a suite at the Clarion Hotel. And just before the, before the polls closed, uh, my campaign manager, Luke Lewandowski, uh, and some other team members had come in and said, look, we, we think it's going to go well for us tonight. You know, we have this sense based on the, you know, the work that we've been doing in advance that it's, you know, that it should be a good night for us. And so I've been in enough campaigns before um, to know that um, and know these you know, my team, that they're not going to give us false hope. And so when the one TV station called it early for, for Mr. Murray, um, I was, I was surprised. I was a little bit stunned and, and just wondering, okay, what, what's happened here? Because that's not the information we had before the night began. And I can't imagine that my team would have been that far off, but um you know, we, we just kind of sat with that information for a bit. I wasn't sure what to do with it. I thought this is, this was a bit of a surprise to me. And then it start, you know, it started to sink in. I got a little bit deflated. My, you know, my campaign manager came into the room a few minutes later and said, no, hold on. I don't know what's, you know, th th that station is doing. We, uh, we have other information coming in and it was this, it was that the early results were kind of maybe uh, closer to the results from the uh, center of the city and we knew we were stronger in the suburbs and that's where we had to appeal to the suburbs to win this race and those numbers still needed to come in so um so we took some comfort in that um the other thing though as far as the, the voter turnout um yeah i mean let's let's be honest for those of us who love democracy the voter low voter turnout was was disappointing um was i surprised i, I think given that i had been watching the news out of Ontario two days earlier when they had had their municipal elections and even in open races in cities in Ontario, the voter turnout was well below 50% in some cases. And so maybe that's just indicative of what's happening across the country right now. But, um, you know, for those of us, again, that, that, that um, value deeply value democracy, the de democratic process, we all want to see higher voter turnout. I want to see higher voter turnout. You know, I've, worked, I've had a chance to be on a few mayoral campaigns now, in either in the back rooms or covering it as media. And uh, one thing that's very notable about a Winnipeg mayoral campaign, particularly in the current times, is a real kind of uh, like a like a like a coming out of coming from behind story. And, and I think that what we saw with both Bowman and yourself is uh, a candidate who initially was not in first place, but then came from the back. What do you think that is about a Winnipeg, um, a, a Winnipeg political characteristic? Well, I, I wonder if, if a bit of it is, is that voters don't make up their mind until later, late in, in, in the campaign. Um, because you're, you're right. I know in 2014 with, uh, you know, um, Brian Bowman and, and Judy Wasilisa Lisa, there was a wide gap. Um, in, and there was this time too. Summertime. I mean, it depends yeah. if you believe the polls, right? Right. And exactly. And this time too, it was very similar. There was a wide gap between myself and Glenn Murray. If you, if you look at Jan, uh, J July's polls and it, it could have been a couple of things. I think, you know, we talked about it as a team. Um, the voters didn't make up their mind until obviously late in the race. And just with the sheer volume, 11 candidates in the race, you know, someone said to me, well, maybe it's a bit of voter almost paralysis. There's just too much uh, noise. All the candidates are saying something and it's hard for people, you know, the average voter to decipher who's saying what. Um, and so th there could be several factors in, involved in that. But I, I think it's, you know, I, I think, again, what happened in 2014 with um, seemingly, you know, Brian Bowman's come from behind and, and this, this summer with my kind of come from behind or at least 
you know, the early polls, not indicative of the final results. Uh, I, I think that's a, uh, a reminder to everybody that um, in democratic races, it's not over till it's over. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the criticism of polling is oftentimes mm-hmm. the uh, whether the polls got it right in the first place. And uh, I think that's a, you know, that's a up for debate here and there. But, but you know, if you saw the breakdown of the vote, we ran a, a map um, of the breakdown of the vote in the city, and you were the only candidate that got uh, uh, votes completely across the city. Almost every other candidate was regional. Um, and so uh, I want to show you a picture here, if you don't mind. Um, mm-hmm. I've got a picture right here. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> <laughs> this is high level multimedia stuff this is, going this on is, here. Yeah. This is the high kind of quality we have at the Free Press at Negon. Um, yeah. But uh, I don't know if you can see that, but that is you in the North Point Douglas Women's Center. Yes. Uh, uh, packing a boxes. Now, I mean, I think everybody knows that I'm I'm a heavy volunteer. I'm a captain with the Mama Bear Clan uh, in the North Point Douglas area. We go out. We were out last night uh, in the snow, handing out our gifts to our relatives and visiting tent cities and so on. I think um, a possible criticism and things that I have heard people worried about is that uh, you are going to be more worried about the suburbs than you will be with downtown. Uh, But yet, um, you know, I saw you walking with the Mama Bear clan. I wasn't there that night, but of course, uh, we all, all the captains share information about those who come and volunteer for us. And so there was mention, you didn't talk about that on the campaign of having done that work, but but I think that, you know, maybe perhaps you didn't want to draw attention. Maybe you wanted it for your own experience. Everybody has their own reason to walk with us uh, to come and visit our relatives in the downtown area. But I think that the one thing that I think people may be concerned about is that you're going to be looking more towards that suburbs, you mm-hmm. know, talking more about infrastructure, which is perhaps not so much those in poverty in downtown worried about. Um, what would you say to that? Um, I, a couple of things. I, I think that I can tell you what, you know, it's, it's uh, one month, basically one month Saturday, it, it, you know, since since being elected. So much of my focus even right now, as far as getting things up and running is around, uh, like I've got it right in front of me right now, uh, senior advisor on homelessness uh, and addictions and, and, and community safety. I said that one of my city's one of my staff members uh, from, from the mayor staff would, would be that person, a liaison. So that is a focus uh, of, uh, will, you know, as a focus in my campaign, it will be a focus from my office as well as assisting Winnipeggers right now who are struggling, uh, that are unsheltered, homeless, struggling with addiction. Um, I've been focused a lot already on, on the downtown, you know, talking about investments in downtown community safety partnership and making our downtown stronger. Um, I've already been out, you know, quietly without taking pictures. I've been out with a couple of, uh, the groups we're we're cleaning up uh, we're cleaning up garbage, uh, you know, and and refuse in um, just along Main Street, you know, a, a little while ago, and so um, I, I I need to be I will be a mayor for all of Winnipeg, from the core area of the city to the furthest suburbs, and so each respective community has its opportunities as its needs, and it's 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 my role, it's my responsibility to work with others to make sure that to the best as possible all the needs across the city from the core to the furthest reaches of, of the suburbs are, are met and, and that's my goal so it it, it is uh, it's it's perhaps one of the great weaknesses of opinion writers uh in newspapers that you know we we tend to become focused on one or two things and then we tend to de- we tend to develop larger opinions based on one or two things. So I'm going to engage in a little bit of that right now, but sure. and then I'm going to ask you to react to it. So, you know, one of the one of the aspects of your campaign and following up on Nagant's questions is the fact that you're you you really put a lot of your political capital into a plan to increase property taxes by more than the current uh, increase that Mayor Bowman was using and dedicate that money to two huge infrastructure projects. So we have the we have Chief Pegwas Trail and Keniston. One is a widening, the other one is a lengthening. But I mean, really what we're talking about is, you know, a billion dollars by the time it's all done of infrastructure that really is dedicated primarily to serving suburban neighborhoods. So do you would you acknowledge that when, when you've put so much political capital into that one plan, that you've got some work to do to, to sort of show people that you are a mayor for the whole city. 
I think so. And I think respectfully to see those two projects as only or primarily serving suburbs, I think under uh, underappreciates the importance of the projects because the the projects, both both the widening of Kennison, let's start there, the widening of Kennison Boulevard. For Nawe Odina, for that exciting Indigenous-led economic development to be successful necessitates the widening of Keniston Boulevard. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have pinch points and it's going to be, you know, that that project, which really needs to happen, is, is not going to be able to, you know, reach its full capacity. Um, but, but the widening of Keniston Boulevard and the extension of Chief Pegos Trail are, are they're really, their economic routes, their trade routes is what they are primarily. Um, I, I think if people see them only as, well, that's going to expand the suburbs or serve the suburbs, yes, it's going to do that. But I think that sells those projects short. With the development of Centerport South, which is very critical to having serviced industrial lands available so we can attract you know, mobile capital attract investors from other parts of Canada and 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 then also, you know, give opportunity for businesses here to expand. That project needs to happen. And so the widening of Keniston and the extension of Chief Pegasus both will serve and help service um, Centerport South. And here's what's key. We have the, 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 those are so those become economic development routes is what they really become. And Winnipeg's economy has got to be strong to raise the revenues that fund all the services that we need as Winnipegers, including services uh, in our downtown. But at the same time, when it comes to downtown, you know, I, I'm meeting with the downtown. Uh, I just, we were just at the AGM of the downtown biz the other day. I met with Sarah Stasiak of the Forks. We're, you know, we're talking about, I've got a meeting, uh, you know, um, coming up in time with uh, Grand Chief Jerry Daniels about, uh, you know, the SCO's project on the Bay. So there, I, I have both focuses going on right now, or all focuses going on because we're building this city as a whole. I mean, that's good, good to hear too, uh, that you're talking a little bit about uh, really what you're talking about is urban reserve structures and the the fact that urban reserves are, and I'm going to show my bias here, but I think everybody would know that I've written enough about it. I mean, they're a win-win for the city yes. and evidence is just Saskatoon, it literally saved parts of Saskatoon and so on. Um, and also, you know, it, it's a it's a win-win for everybody in terms of property values, commercial development and so on, urban reserves. Um, but I want to get more, you know, I want to get into uh, another question that I think other voters because you know i i have i happen to be involved with a lot of different communities that uh that maybe didn't vote for you but have a lot of questions about you and so they they want to know uh particularly in the indigenous community uh you know they're one thing that people had heard a lot about or people know about is that you're you're passed as a pentecostal minister i mean you spent over 20 years as a minister um, and you've now left the work in the church to do politics, which in many ways is still service work, of course, for the people and for building community. Um, but it, it may uh, it may concern some people that perhaps in uh, segments of the Pentecostal church, there are particular views around um, uh, homosexuality, around same-sex marriage, around the uh, perhaps, you know, there is some always in our communities around Christianity, some concerns around uh, saviorism. And, and what might you say to a person, uh, particularly an Indigenous person, who would be worried about um, thinking about, you know, here's a Christian minister coming to now lead the city. Uh, that alone is a little bit triggering for many of our communities. But at the same time, I, I know that, you know, I know you and I know the ways that you've uh, worked. So I, I appreciate uh, the question. I, I think you, you hit you hit a key word that for me, I try to keep in front of me always, uh, Nigan and Dan, and that's service, service to others. Right. Um, and and so that. I try to focus on that as a leadership style. It's it's a servant leadership. Um, my role is to is to serve all people uh, as mayor uh, equally, and so um, so no matter who who uh, who a person is, no matter where they come from, no matter their uh, you know no matter their race, uh, sexual orientation, economic status in life, um, my my job is to to serve 
everybody. And that's, that's really, that's really my goal to treat people equally um, and to, and to work in such a way that, you know, everybody could, could, can appreciate and see that oh, this, this, this guy's here trying to make my life better, trying to, you know, give of himself, working with others um, to, to improve, you know, people's uh, pl place in life and, and have their needs met. And, and that's, that's really the framework that I, that I try to approach every day with and, and every role with. That's, that's the view I had when I was a minister, my eight years on council, people have had a chance to see me work, you know, and, and that's the, 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 the approach I try to take. And it's certainly the approach I, I'm, I'm going to be trying to, to take as, as the mayor of the city. And, I mean, also, too, one thing that I've uh, you, you and I have talked about this off camera and, and things like that is is there are there is a very special and unique relationship. Uh, in Winnipeg being that it's the birthplace of Treaty 1, right. uh, it's the foundational legal relationship Canada has, the very first footstep of Canada's legal relationship with Indigenous peoples. So there is a special obligation, would you not agree, that with the Indigenous community because of that, you know, in many ways, the template for Canada is in Winnipeg, therefore we have a uh, an extra obligation to commit to Indigenous peoples, honour treaties, do projects like the uh, Cap Young Barracks, um, you know, Indigenous development, Hudson Bay development, and so on. You're seeing radical movements in the city, and I think it's because of Mayor Bowman and some of the commitments he's made. And will you continue those? Uh, I, so I agree with you, yes. Let me just answer that first and just say that I think some of the ongoing uh, for lack of better term, challenges that we see um, related to what, what indigenous indigenous people are 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 fighting through, working through, struggling through, but but also the, on the other side, there's, there's such great opportunity. We talk about, for example, Nawe Odina as one example of just the potential there, um, and and I think that Winnipeg should be the center, the epicenter of growth and success and, 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 and improving uh, not only those, those relationships, but the opportunities and success. Um, and with the, you, you talk about win-win scenarios, right? For indigenous, non-indigenous people. I give uh, Mayor Bowman credit, absolutely. And I think, you know, he, he was really focused on, to his credit, focused on um, reconciliation. He established the, you know, the Winnipeg's Indigenous Accord. Uh, I signed on on day one. I want to extend that and continue. For me now, it's taking and and um, it's taking what we, we we what we signed on to and now really really actioning it, um, so that you see, for lack of a better term, tangible more and more tangible expressions of reconciliation. Um, I don't think Nawe Odina is it's certainly not the first. It'll be the largest, but it won't be the last. You know, indigenous-led economic development zone in, in Winnipeg. I see see more of that happening. Winnipeg is so far behind other places, like it's you know, um, uh, like like Saskatoon when it comes to as you indicate urban reserves. We have a lot of work to do, but we can do it, and we should do it. So I'm just going to follow up uh, briefly because you did a couple of fascinating interviews during the campaign about your transition from the church in into politics, and in particular. There was a lot of attention on, um, as uh, Nagan said, elements of the Pentecostal church that take a very negative view of homosexuality and same-sex relationships. So in those interviews, what you basically said is that you had grown. You'd grown into a different understanding and a different perspective. And what I'm particularly interested in is, you know, maybe epiphany is too hard, you know, too big a word, but this this uh, change in worldview, did it start while you were a minister? Uh, is is the changing views one of the reasons why you, you left that position and went into mainstream politics? Or was it something you grew into after you went into politics? Well, I, I think that the, the, the change, you know, in, in, in view, um, I, I don't know. I can't remember, you know, point to when it started, certainly uh, probably before politics. It's not the reason I, you know, left uh, ministry, pastoral ministry for, for politics. It was more of a timing and opportunity. But look, we, we live 
in a nation where we value human rights and that people should have the opportunity, not the opportunity, people should be treated equally. Uh, and in Canada, civil marriage is, is, is defined by the government and guarantees that people, you know, of all sexual orientation should have the, the right um, to, to marry. And so, um, and so, so I, I, you know, I, I agree with that, that, that we need to make sure in this, in this society, we're treating one another um, equally and fairly to the degree we can. But you would agree that there was a time in your life where you, you didn't, you didn't have that view though, That's where you were more in line with the, with church doctrine. So what, so what, what is your, your view of it now of that, of that doctrine? Uh, I, I don't know that this is, a, a, you know, uh, maybe not for you, maybe not from other people right and wrong, but you know, the, the 2018 uh, general constitution, of the Pentecostal church is it's pretty strong words about inexcusable behavior um you know how do you like how do you unload that baggage as you move forward yeah um i don't have the 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 uh you know the 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 doctrine from from the church in front of me right now to, to look at it word for word so it just i think suffice to say dan yeah that you know i many years ago i held i would hold that view um, I, I hold a, a different view now, and that's that people should be should be treated fairly and equally. Um, I understand why you know the church holds that view, um, and and it's you know the, the Pentecostal church is not alone in you know in in this um, in looking at this. I mean because so many churches, so many different not just churches, not just Christian churches, but different faith communities as well. Right. Um, you know, um, are uh, have looked at this, or will will be looking at this, and and so. Um, but for personally, as I said, you know, I'm, I'm at the place where, you know, people uh, should be given equal treatment in in our nation. Um, I appreciate I appreciate that because it's going to be impossible to work with the indigenous community without a sense of. Uh, um, understanding that sexuality is complex and identity is complex. And uh, we are end people. We are people that have multiple identities. Um, we would be the closest you would call queer, which is what Indigenous identity is. It's about the gray areas. It's about connection, kinship, and so on. So, uh, but we, we, we don't define ourselves according to sex. It's often by kin, right? So the love of the land is as much of the love of the person as well. So, so I, I really appreciate that you're, that you've uh, thought through those things, particularly because it's so key, that relationship with Indigenous identity, but um, you know, relationships has been a big part of what I think it is with the mayor. The mayor is such a interesting position because you have to hold a lot of relationships very key. Uh, one of the things my father often says is civic politics is the closest politics to the people. Right. Uh, you know, it's different than provincial, different than federal. Civic politics is really about the people. And so you're going to, in lots of ways, have to advocate for the city. Uh, and at the moment, the city has had a uh, a combative relationship with the province. And so what do you think it is, uh, you know, you yourself have had some combative relationships with the premier, particularly talking around timelines. Um, how might you move forward uh, with the premier? And what do you think are some some dynamics to that relationship that are important to think about? I'd, I'd like to try to reset the relationship with the city and the province really, and, and around kind of some win-win scenarios. Uh, reduce the adversarial approach, try to collaborate and, and show how, you know, uh, some of the opportunities we have are mutually beneficial. It, 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 the opportunities we have in the city are mutually beneficial, not only for the city of Winnipeg, but also for the province of Manitoba. Um, and some of the challenges we face are, are challenges that, yes, they're the city of Winnipeg challenges, but they're really a challenge for the province of Manitoba as well. You know, a, a quick story that uh, that I've shared on the campaign trail many months ago. I went out with our, I went out with our um, transit inspectors, went bus shelter to bus shelter. You know, stopping in first thing in the morning, visiting those who are living in the bus shelters, and got to one. A man had overdosed. 
called nine, we called 911. The transit inspector, you know, was told by the operator, you're going to have to start CPR, chest compressions on this ma'am. By the time the ambulance arrived, you know, my first thought looking at this man laying on the floor of the transit shelter was this is someone's son we're trying to keep alive. And then my second thought was I looked up and saw a dozen, a dozen city of Winnipeg employees, transit inspectors, uh, firefighters, paramedics, paramedic supervisor, 911 operator, a dozen city of Winnipeg employees. And what that man needs, he doesn't need city services. That man needs detox, long-term recovery, mental health services, health services, housing. All of those that I, services I just listed really are the purview of another level of government. So there's no, but there's no sense in me as mayor kind of, you know, throwing grenades at other levels of government to say, you know, you, you, this is your responsibility. We, we have to now come together and say, okay, as a city, we'll take our part, but we need you province and we need your federal government and we need indigenous governments and we need uh, nonprofit sectors. We have to come together to tackle this shared challenge. And so my relationship with senior levels of government I want to come at it from that, that point of view. Um, I'll get my elbows up where I need to defend the people of Winnipeg, you know, but, um, but where we can share and coordinate and collaborate on seizing opportunities and tackling problems, we, we need to do that. That's the kind of relationship that I want to foster, not only with the current premier, but any future premier as well. So I'm just, I was, I'm going to ask you a question about your, your three biggest challenges going forward, because then that'll give us the the three benchmarks that we can measure. Let's say your first year in office. Uh, so, mm -hmm. um, but I'm I'm interested. So you've uh, you've been asked about a safe consumption sites, and uh, that's a pretty profound experience uh, that you had at the bus shelter. Right. And I don't know exactly when you've made statements and, and whether it was in you know before or after that experience, but. Um, I think your your current position is that you you haven't ruled out the idea of safe consumption sites, but you you won't do it without the province, who is categorically at least this government categorically fundamentally opposed. Which is kind of all I will say. That's kind of like pledging support for something you know that's never going to happen. So after your experience, though, can you see an argument for finding ways of working around the province to get this done? Uh, theoretically, Dan, yes, but practically, no. The reason is because supervised consumption sites, first and foremost, are healthcare. Mm -hmm. The city doesn't have a healthcare department. We, we just don't. And so I think it would be, I think in the long term, it, it would be uh, a dangerous step to take for us as the city of Winnipeg to launch into supervised consumption sites on our own. Or, or with the federal government, because we just don't have the department, we don't have the capacity, we don't have the purview to provide the people we're trying to help with the very help that they need. We, we just we just won't have those kind of resources um, because it's not just about supervised consumption side. It's not just about the healthcare component, but every other service that is needed for individuals to help the people we, we need to help needs to be co-located. So mm -hmm. there needs to be uh, detox available and and access to to other services, housing services and 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 mental health services and and you know you you name it needs to be co-located in my view with supervised consumption sites and so because of the whole suite of services I think are really necessary to help individuals who are trying to help we, 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 the city can't go it alone I just I just don't think yep. it's a prudent thing to do. Will, will you have you or will you? communicate to uh, Health Minister Audrey Gordon or the Premier that the city wants this and wants to find a way of working with them to do it. Is, it, is that going to be the position you communicate to, uh, to the Premier? Yeah, I, 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 will, I will say, I'll reiterate to the Premier and to the Health Minister, I'm very, very open to that. If they, if they're, you know, if they want to lead on this, if they would lead on this, and it saves lives and gives people an opportunity to, uh, you know, to get the help they need, then yeah, yes, I'm, I'm very open to being a partner in this, but I the, the city, you know, while I'm married, just I can't see us leading. I just I just don't yeah. think we have the resources uh, or purview or response. Uh, responsibility is the wrong word. The, the, we don't have the resources and the departments to do what needs to be done. So let's look ahead now uh, a year. And uh, um, 
uh, yeah, I mean, I, this is very arbitrary, of course, but I'm going to pick three as a good round number. Uh, not, ambitious, but not too ambitious. Three things that you would like to see accomplished in your first year. Um, so that, and then a year from now when we do, cause this is an annual thing now that we're going to do with the podcast, of course, is I hope your people are listening in on another line. But, uh, so these are the three things that we're going to measure you against, uh, to see whether you've, uh, you've been an effective mayor in your first year. What are those three things? There's more development in our downtown with more people living in the downtown. I think that, that, that has to be key. Um, we, I would like to say there are fewer homeless people or people unsheltered. The, ch the challenge with that, of course, is that um, the, the numbers are, are disputable as far as how many people are really living unsheltered right now. But perhaps we could measure it by, you know, we, we've created X number of more housing units and people are, are, are now in those housing units. We have more people living in housing, you know, off um, that, that are struggling right now with, with homelessness. And I think too, and this becomes very difficult, but we just, we can't be passive on it. Uh, our crime severity index has got to start dropping. It's got to start going down. It needs to be um, a safer city. It, it's very concerning to me. It's troubling to me that we are at a, a record number of homicides in this city this year um we that that that, that needs to start to move in, in in the other direction and see fewer homicides and okay. and the highest indigenous homicides in history too um this year right. uh i wrote about that only about a month and a half ago right. that we were already about to eclipse the highest ever and but yet the highest ever was in 2019 i believe or 2020 so i mean it is it is something that's been happening over a long period of time and so uh, i'm very encouraged to hear you wanting to deal with the issue of uh you know th that you're able to tie together that there's social services and not always the answer is not always just more police and i think oh. that that would be different than some of your other candidates that ran in the election right. um I can't say thanks enough, Scott, for uh, or Mayor Gilligan. Oh, Scott, Scott is good. Your, no, we we agreed it would be your worship. Oh, I think that was goodness. what we agreed. Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, <laughs> on Negon, Negon and the Lone Ranger, I'll I, I'll decide here what we were going to do. <laughs> um, no, I'm just joking. But uh, but I really appreciate uh, you know Scott for all your time and and of course you know I really also appreciate during the campaign that you. Uh, that you're always willing to speak with myself or with others during, and I hope that that communication goes forward in the future. I know that uh, uh, many of us have a very positive relationship, even though very combative, you know, argumentative at times with Mayor Bowman, uh, but that we can continue that and that we're all invested in the success of the city. So I really appreciate your time and giving us 45 minutes of your day. Really appreciate that. No, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be with both of you. And I, do, I know this, right? I mean, everyone in this city is... Um, Playing a part. I'll maybe say this quickly. What has been really, really encouraging through the campaign and then even in the last month since being sworn in, there are so many people um, across the city who just want to be part of the solution, want to be part of making a better Winnipeg. It's been it's been so encouraging to hear people from every different corner of the city, every walk of life, that just says we you know we can do better and we want to let us know how we can help, and that that is really encouraging. Well, my family has always been here, literally, since the very first beginning. And then, of course, all of our uh, newcomers that came and joined with our family. So uh, so I have deep investments at this place, and I'm very encouraged to hear that message uh, from you. Um, I'm also very thankful that you're able to give us some time on the Negon Long Ranger podcast. I'm also very happy that you gave Dan so much airspace. Uh, we don't normally allow that in all of our interviews. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Scott. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you both. Have a great day. What a great interview with the incoming mayor and pretty, uh, you know, pretty revealing. I almost feel like there was some, you know, news made there. Uh, we talked to the mayor about not just uh, his plan, but also some of his history. And I think that the public should be aware of that. And I'm, uh, I'm you know, a bit hard hitting for Negon and the Lone Ranger there, Dan. Yeah, well, uh, you know, it was only a matter of time before we started making news on this podcast. <laughs> right. You know, like it's, uh, you know, but I, I mean, like, you know, it, it is true. Like, uh, if you if you ask the, the simple and obvious questions, 
um, you know, uh, a lot of times people will uh, respond. And, and I agree that, uh, you know, uh, he said several things that were uh, pleasantly eye-opening, I think is uh, the way I would put it. But, uh, you know, what a generous thing to do. Uh, he hasn't done a lot of media. Uh, all I really have seen is there's a McLean's piece that he's done, you know, so mm -hmm. it's very nice that the mayor would do that. But let's move to, you know, something that's been happening in the city this week. It's sort of related, I think, a little bit to the things we mm -hmm. spoke about. Um, this week, the there's been a controversy involving the Youth for Christ building, uh, the Youth for Christ presence in downtown. Uh, for those of you that are outside of Winnipeg, uh, in downtown Winnipeg, there is a, a presence organization called Youth for Christ, nationally known uh, organization uh, that's received public funds to build infrastructure, particularly a skate park. Um, but then also this huge building uh, with uh, youth programming and uh, millions of dollars of public money in which they've received and also government programs um uh like uh the you know for employing summer jobs and so on like that they've received hundreds of thousands of government money millions of dollars of tax support um to really support a missionization project in downtown and what they've been accused of this week is anti-homophobia anti-lgbtq uh, uh which they are very open with uh to say this is not part of our our way this is not part of our our belief system and the real question is, is what are they doing in downtown Winnipeg, which, of course, is 60, 70 percent at times Indigenous peoples and particularly unhoused populations? Yeah, you know, uh, like I'm going to go back uh, a few years uh, to when this idea was sort of first proposed. And, um, you know, when the uh, the idea for this facility right at the corner of uh, the northwest corner of uh, Main Street and Higgins, I mean, you know, in a in a, an area of great need and a great, you know, focus of, of uh, social programming, you know, there was a lot of, there were a lot of organizations that bristled at the idea that public money, taxpayer money would go to a, uh, an evangelical organization that part of its mission is the conversion uh, of youth, uh, you know, to Christianity. And again, you know, like, you know, given the experience, as you say, of the indigenous people in that part of the city, you know, it always seemed like it was going to be a little bit of a square peg in a round hole. Now, initially, I actually partly defended the application um, in a column because they it was so well organized and they had their money in place. They had their plan in place and because they kind of talked the inclusive talk. Right. Like they, uh, they, they, they said made, they were going to yeah. downplay that yeah. part and they were going to make public space available for anybody yeah. to come in and so on. Now, that that really hasn't yeah. materialized. No. So what we've had is, uh, you know, s stories in the free press and in the uh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation online indicating that uh, the organization is trying to suppress and, and sort of gag uh, LGBTQ uh, youth. Uh, and the people who support them, they have asked uh, staff and volunteers to sign a pledge, which, although it, it does not disparage uh, same-sex relationships specifically, it does, in fact, you know, loud traditional, uh, you know, uh, relationships and uh, uh, makes it quite clear that, that same-sex relationships are not acceptable. Um, you know, people don't have to sign this pledge, but if they don't, the stories indicate that they've been told they can't talk about LGBTQ issues. Um, staff wanted to create uh, a one night a week where, uh, you know, uh, LGBTQ skateboarders could come and, and skateboard in a safe place where they with with, with their own people. Uh, that was turned down. You, you know, I think that the most alarming part of this, and there was you know, about $5 million in upfront capital money that, that came from the federal provincial governments, hundreds of thousands of dollars more each year in grants to pay for summer job positions and things like this, is the, 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 the lack of concern by federal and provincial politicians. Um, you know, Eileen Clark, who is the uh, municipal relations minister uh, for the progressive conservative government. I mean, she basically said, you know, yeah, it's a concern. You know, we're definitely going to have to take in, you know, the, these news reports. We'll have to take that in consideration when we're, um, 
uh, approving future grants. But you know, like really, where where is well, the, the leadership here? Where where's is the, the elected? Somebody's got to go and sit down with the, with Youth for Christ and say, "Look, this is what you said. We expect you to you know start living up to what you've done, or else let's set up a repayment plan for the five or, million dollars." Yeah. yeah. Or how about this? Uh, isn't Christianity supposed to be about love? Like, isn't- oh man, come on! You're you're really you're going to do that, are you? You know, <laughs> like it's. No, but that but that is the great that's the great Achilles heel, the great hypocrisy, right? It isn't isn't you know Christianity supposed to be about inclusivity? Wasn't it Jesus that washed the feet of people and cared for those and and accepted those from all different ways and perspectives? Even the Pope, even the Pope on the visit uh, just recently back in July, uh, said that those who are different than us. Uh, when doing their culture and practices, and I was speaking about Indigenous peoples, but, um, you know, Indigenous peoples or Indigenous culture is inherently queer. I mean, it's inherently about the grey areas, the two-spirit lives, the, 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 the ways in which we love both the land and people, humans and non um, the ways in which we have multiple different ways and diversity uh, in the ways in which we love that isn't just tied to sex, but is also tied with a sense of of queerness of the ways in which we live with the world. Uh, even the Pope said when Indigenous peoples are uh, in their own cultures and ceremonies, they are showing the presence of God. And in, in it seems as though these evangelical organizations and, you know, certainly Youth for Christ isn't the only one, but uh, it, it seems to be that there is real deafness or a cherry picking of their own faith when it comes to LGBTQ, when it comes to uh, all alternative ways of looking at the spirit. Uh, and so just yet again, in the most needing you know area of the city, uh, here we have an evangelical organization that reminds us a lot of the history of residential schools and violence when it comes to imposing cultures on others. Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, I mean, you mentioned leadership and, you know, really, I think what we need uh, in a story like this is we need an elected official with sufficient gravitas to meet with the church, uh, to meet with Youth for Christ and say, look, um, you know, what are we, like, what are we doing here? Uh, Can we, you know, can we reach an agreement to have one evening a week where we provide a safe space for LGBTQ uh, youth. In the end, I think we understand that the, the 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 reputation of Youth for Christ, which, by the way, the the only the only statement that they've publicly made is that uh, you know uh, you know basically they respect people of all backgrounds and uh, you know uh, uh, there, there's no discrimination. Uh, you know, at, at work in their work, but there clearly is. And if n- nothing else, there is a concern by people within the organization. And, you know, so here's the open invitation. As soon as, uh, let's say, the senior federal minister, Dan Vandell, or uh, Eileen Clark, or, uh, you know, maybe families minister, uh, Rochelle Squires, or maybe even the mayor of Winnipeg, who, if you listen to our previous interview, was a former Pentecostal minister, who embraced uh, idea condemned yeah. yeah and condemned same sex relationships and then ultimately came to a more evolved position where he supports them you know can we please you know and and uh, Denise or anybody else of our handful of listeners would you go out there and put some pressure on people to find you know to find someone to step in and broker a deal this doesn't have to be a formal you know human rights commission inquiry we just need somebody to step in and broker a deal and you heard it here first because we are we're calling it out and they can come on the negon and lone ranger podcast go on a ride with us and we can solve all the cities the cities and the world's problems which is yet again at the end of another episode here uh we want to thank uh, Adam Flynn, uh, all the great people at CJNU. Thank you for mispronouncing Adam's last name because, oh, like, I thought I was the only one that got last names wrong. It's Adam Glynn. Did I say, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So I've been called to, worse. Yeah. <laughs> thanks to Adam Glynn and all the great people at CJNU. 
uh, our colleagues at the Winnipeg Free Press and uh, editor Paul Simin, and of course, all the listeners that reach out to us uh, every week, uh, all millions of you that have uh, evidence from our last Missing Our podcast that uh, clearly we're reaching about three of you, and one of them is my mom. Yeah, it's well, you, that's that's countervailed by the fact that none of my family listen to this. So they're, they're too busy to listen to the, did you hear my podcast? No, no, I didn't. <laughs> much to everybody. Thanks so much for listening. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode of Me Gone and the Lost Ranger. And the Lost Ranger. There we go. Mm-hmm.